Hi, everybody. My name is Tommy Bergstrom, and I'm going to be starting off our three-day series of the Wild and Wonderful Wetlands. Um, I work for DEP, which is the Department of Environmental Protection, and I work within the Watershed Improvement Branch. And you might notice that I have a lot of water-related titles on this page here. Um, so I serve there as the Watershed Basin and Project WET Coordinator um, for the western part of the state. So very excited to be here with you today. Uh, this is my, my second talk I've done with, um, with this group and it was a great experience in person before. So it's nice to meet everybody virtually as well. Uh, so just to give you a quick overview of what you're getting into with us. Uh, this first session will be with me today, and I'm going to be introducing you to different wetland types and the biodiversity that we find here, and we'll have a special focus on inurans. Um, tomorrow you'll be with Jack Hopkins. He's also within our water division, and he's going to be telling you all about West Virginia specific wetlands. So the types that we have in our state and location, and also a little history of the regulations that have been in place um, what, what's happened to wetlands over the years, and you have a special focus on avians. And then on Thursday, you'll be, um, your presenter will be Martin Chris, and he was going to talk about the chemical exchanges of wetlands. And they have a lot of really, really neat things that they do, chemically speaking, um, within them. So he's going to have a special focus on wetland soils and plant strategies. So excited to have you for all three sessions. So today we're gonna to do a little warm up. I know that it's 1230, maybe you just had lunch and you're feeling a little snoozy. Um, so I'm gonna to try to keep you as engaged as I possibly can today. And I will be asking you to use your chat box to communicate with me in some form. So make sure you have that pulled up and handy. Uh, we'll be getting into different types of wetland habitats and how we categorize them. We'll look at the different functions that wetlands provide to us and also we'll take a, a quick look at biodiversity and specifically at inurans. And we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. So to get us started, um, since we're not in a classroom and I can't read your facial expressions and you know, your body language, I'd like for you to tell me what is your wetland animal mood? Um, so you can do that by typing it into the chat box, which number you are. So maybe today you're feeling a little snappy, just the pandemic stuff's getting you down. You feel a little bit like our snapping turtle in box four here. Um, maybe you just wanna curl up like this fawn down here and just hide in the grass. Uh, maybe you're a grumpy toad today. Maybe you're having a, a weird hair day. I'm not sure, so just give me um, a little information on how you're doing today. Okay, so we have Cindy, at, she's feeling like an eight. We have some fives and threes, a couple more eights. All right, so everybody's all across the spectrum. We've got a lot of eights today. That's great. <laughs> Laura's feeling like a one. All right, awesome. Well, I, ha I had my second cup of coffee, so I should be feeling about like a number seven today. I'm feeling pretty cheerful now, <laughs> but I might have been a six this morning when I woke up. Um, we know that these days are hard, so um, thanks for joining us today to learn about wetlands. So now that I know a little bit about you, I know kind of where everybody's from, um, and then also, um, you know, how you're feeling today, I'm going to give you a little, a little bit of background information on me. Um, so. I am fortunate to be from one of the areas of the largest wetland complex in West Virginia, and that's in Canaan Valley. So I didn't, I don't live in Canaan Valley currently. I didn't live there before, but I live just down off the mountain in a little town called Dry Fork. And I spent a lot of time working and recreating in the Canaan Valley area. And it has a beautiful wetland complex if you ever get the opportunity to go visit it. Um, I then went to Marshall University and I, I studied biological science, so I got a, bi, a um, BS degree there, and then also a master's. And on my master's, I had a special focus on herpetology. And herpetology is just a fancy word for the study of reptiles and amphibians. 
So while I was there, I, I studied um, frog calls and toad calls, which are neurons. So this is a little example of what that looks like um, when it's on a spectrograph. So you can actually identify the animals just based on their call, just like you can with birds. Um, so this is me up here. I spent a lot of time out with a headlamp on, mucking around in wetlands. And I have to say it was probably one of the most enjoyable things I've ever done with my time. Um, so I, I really love that experience. Um, from there, I went on to work at the Mon Forest, and I worked on a lot of different wildlife restoration projects in West Virginia, uh, which was a really neat experience. And quite a bit of that was with wetland restoration, because we have lost a lot of wetlands in our state. Jack will be telling you more about that tomorrow. Um, but I also did some research with flying squirrels and with different types of birds, and it was a really great experience. Um, now I'm at DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, and I do all kinds of stuff there. Um, we are public servants. So we are here to help the public with whatever issues we can, environmentally speaking. And my main focus is on watersheds. And wetlands, of course, are part of that. So we collaborate on different watershed improvement projects. Um, so if there's an impaired waterway, we can try to help you with that. I do a lot of environmental education outreach that relate to water. Um, I host workshops for educators across the state for free, so we can train them in our project wet curriculum. Um, and then we do a lot of paperwork too, shuffle papers around writing, managing, and sharing grant opportunities. But basically, we're here to help the public. So if you ever have questions about water, you can feel free to reach out to me. All right, so let's get us warmed up a little bit more. Um, I'm going to play the, a little section of this video here, and the video part is not going to change, but the sounds are going to change. So I'd like for you to listen and type in the chat box different things that you hear. And if you're not sure, you can just take a best guess at it. I'm going to let this play for about 10 or 15 seconds. Okay, so I have some people saying they hear different birds. That's right. We're going to forward just a little bit more. Ah, we have some birders in the group. Excellent. Wonderful. I like to uh, just close my eyes and just listen to different wetland sounds sometimes. Um, if we could let this go on more, we would hear some splashing from different waterfowl entering the water. Also just the nice ripple of the water brushing up against the plants. Um, we can't really hear the plants, but we can hear the water knocking on them and the, and the animals in them. There's also some um, different frog calls that would come up on this. Um, and so if you had to just define what a wetland is just based off this picture and based off what you heard, um, how do you think you would define it? <laughs> Obviously, it has many birds in it because many people um, pointed that out. So we're going to get into this definition here a little bit more. And we're going to continue our warm up. So I'd like for you to tell me in the chat box how you feel about wetlands. Just pick one word. When you think of a wetland, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Go ahead and drop that in the chat box for me. Um, and this is something that you can create a list at home and follow along as we go through today and even throughout the next two presentations. Okay. Awesome, frogs, essential diversity, water plants, smelly shoes, <laughs> ecology protected. These are all excellent words. Um, when I do a workshop, this Wow the Wonders of Wetlands workshop with educators, I always start off the workshop with the pros and cons list of wetlands. Usually, um, I get a lot of cons. I don't get too many pros in the beginning. And it looks like you all might already have a little bit of knowledge about wetlands, which is wonderful because I don't see too many cons yet. Um, but usually people say, you know, they're wet, which is not a good thing. Ugh, they're wet, they're muddy, they're smelly, they have bugs, and there's a good place for snakes and bears to hang out. 
Um, so most people, generally speaking, are not big fans of wetlands and they have negative associations with them. Um, my goal, of course, is to always make this pro list really long um, by the end of the talk. So at home, feel free to jot stuff down if you'd like to. You can take notes and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, so this activity that we're going to get started with here is called wetland metaphors. And essentially, I have this bag and it's full of different things that relate or represent what a wetland does. So I'm going to pull an item out and then you can write in the chat box how you think it represents a wetland. Okay, so our first item is a cradle. Um, so how do you think a cradle relates to a wetland? If you have an answer or a guess, go ahead and type it in the chat box. Um, no answer is wrong here. How does a cradle relate to a wetland? Okay, it nurtures babies, breeding grounds, safe place. Wonderful, yes. That's right. So it can a cradle can relate to a wetland just like it's a nursery. So it provides shelter, it protects, and it feeds young wildlife, all types of young wildlife that we're going to learn a little bit more about today. So a wetland is a lot like a cradle. Okay, our next item here is a strainer. How does a wetland relate to a strainer? How are those two things represented? You think of a strainer, do you think of a wetland? Because I do. Cleans water and filters, purifies. Yes, excellent. So a wetland is a lot like a strainer in that it strains silt and debris from our water. So it keeps our water clean, it traps sediment. Excellent. Okay, and just our third one here, we're still getting warmed up. An antacid. I always tell everybody, if you're over 30, you know what an antacid is. <laughs> so how does that relate to a wetland? Regulates pH, changes the pH of the water. Okay, good, yeah. pH is our key word there. Um, it can help neutralize. So when we take an antacid, it helps neutralize our stomach acid, what's going on in there. So we don't have indigestion. Um, Wetlands are just like that. They're just a natural neutralizer. So they can neutralize toxic substances. Great, right, wonderful. Thanks for playing along there with me today. Um, so now if we look at our pros and cons list, we already have three new things to add on here. Uh, we know that a, they are a nursery for wildlife. They strain silt and debris and they can neutralize toxins. So like I said earlier, as we go along, feel free to add to this pro list. So what exactly is a wetland? Well, if we want to be kind of a smart aleck, we could say, well, it's a wetland. It's made of both water and land. And that is completely true. And we could stop right there, but we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper. Um, so wetlands have to be, the soil has to be saturated for at least two weeks during the growing season to be considered a wetland. Um, they aren't always covered in water, but they generally have some water on them, especially for a certain period of time. And one really cool thing is that they support both aquatic and terrestrial species. So they aren't just home to frogs that live in the water all the time. They're also home to a lot of animals that spend most of their time on the land. And if we look at the Corps of Engineers definition of a wetland, they would say it has to have three different things, hydrophytic plants, wetland soils, and wetland hydrology. So hydrophytic meaning that these plants have to love water Wetland soils, and uh, Martin will be talking to you a little bit more about what those look like, and then the hydrology, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that today. Um, now, if you look at the Fish and Wildlife Service, they only say that you don't have to have all three of these, but maybe, I think it's just one of them, or maybe two, but you don't have to have all three. We like to go by the Corps of Engineers definition of having all three features, because that is how they are permitted and regulated. So let's take a look at this infograph here. Um, a lot of how we categorize wetlands refers to what types of plants are in them. So we're gonna be using some terms today and I just wanna make sure you have a good understanding of what those terms are. So you might hear me say emergent or you might see it written on the slide, emergent here. So that means that the plants are down in the water. 
Um, their roots are submerged underneath water. Um, depending on how deep they are, we have different you know, uh, terms for them. So if they're submergent, they're completely under the water. If they are sparse and they're starting to come out, some of the foliage is coming out, but their roots are still down in that water table. What this infograph doesn't show is that this water table keeps going all the way across this slide. Okay, so there's still water down underneath here. So some of the roots of this area in the meadow um, are reaching down into that water table as well. And you might notice that as we go uphill away from the water that our plant life changes quite a bit. So naturally, there's usually an area where there's some shrubs and then that leads into a forest with our main um, dominant tree species. So just keep how these plants, um, keep this in mind how these plants are arranged because this is something that we look at a lot whenever we are determining what type of wetland it is. And the key question, are wetlands always wet? Looking at this picture, do you think that they have to always be wet in order to be a wetland? And the answer to that, of course, is no, <laughs> they don't have to always be wet. They don't necessarily have big bodies of water just like this photo. Um, so when we look at wetland habitats, um, we look at the different types of water that they may have in them, soils and plants. So different types of water could mean that it's brackish, that it's salt, that it's fresh water, that it's water that comes from a lake or a river or an ocean. Um, and then of course there's different plant species like we just looked at on the previous slide and the soil types. So we're gonna run through an activity now to look at some common types of wetlands. So this photo here has nine different uh, types of wetlands on it. And as you can tell, they don't all look the same. Um, some of them have open bodies of water and they have big trees in them. Some of them are mainly grass. Um, some of them have standing bits of water. Some of them don't have any water in the photo at all. Um, so how do we separate these out and define them? Uh, we are going to use an activity called wetland habitats. This is another activity from the Wow, the Wonders of Wetlands. And this is just getting us warmed up thinking about um, the types of wetlands that are out there. And we're going to use this flow chart to, to direct us to the different types of wetlands. So let's look at it a little bit closer. Um, you don't have to know every inch of it right now or anything. But if you look at the main question to get us started, it asks, is the land sometimes covered with water or always covered with water? Um, and then it's asked what type of water. So remember there's three different features that it has to have. What type of water is it? What type of plants are there? And then what does the soil look like? So we use these three things to categorize what type of wetland we are looking at. And again, this is just really broad common types of wetlands. So this is our first card. We're gonna categorize this wetland based of what it says on this card. So I'll just read it out loud for you here. You can read along with me if you'd like. Um, old lake beds and other low areas that fill with rainwater sometimes accumulate layers of partially decayed plants called peat. At first glance, these places might look dry, but their moss covered floors actually hold a good deal of fresh water just below the surface. The ground here feels very spongy. Some shrubs and evergreen trees also grow above the sphagnum moss. In these unusual conditions, many unique, beautiful, and rare plants and animals can be found. So we're going to take our card, slide it over here, and pull up our flow chart. So follow along here with me. Is the land sometimes covered with water or always covered with water? And feel free to throw your answer in the chat box if you would like. So was it always covered or sometimes covered with water? Anybody remember? Okay, it was sometimes covered with water. The next question is asking if the water was tidal or not. The water was not tidal, remember? And now we're getting into the type of plant life. So in this one, it was very spongy floor covered by sphagnum moss. And so that takes us down here to a bog. So we can categorize this type of wetland as a bog. We actually have these in our state. Okay, we just look at one more here just to get us a little bit more familiar with how we um, categorize these. So this one is scrubby, low-growing thickets of shrubs grow here in places that may have started out as wet meadows, 
you might find these places near the coast or where lakes, streams, rivers, marshes, and forested swamps overflow. They're not always covered with water. This type of wetland occur, offers good habitat for fish, reptiles, amphibians, and many other animals. So if we go back to our flow chart, again, the first question, is it sometimes covered with water or always? This one is also sometimes. It follows a similar track and that the water is not tidal. And then again, we're looking at the plant life and we know it has mostly shrubs. And so that takes us over here to a shrub swamp. So we just looked at the plants, soils, and what type of water is in there. And we were able to pretty quickly categorize that wetland. So as you see different photos today and over the next two days, look at the picture and see if you have an idea of what type of wetland it might be. You can tell a lot just from a photo. And wetlands have so, so many names. And, and I'll just go through a couple of them really quick here um, to give you a visual of what they look like. But you've probably heard of marshes before. Marshes are always waterlogged and a type of marsh is a prairie pothole. And we don't have those here in West Virginia, but we have them in North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And this is what they look like. We also have uh, wet meadows are considered a type of marsh. Um, sometimes people can go out and kayak in those. If you've ever been down into Florida, you've probably seen the mangroves forest before, and they have brackish water that are along the coast. Estuaries are also um, a place where wetlands form, and this is where the river meets the sea. So we don't have these in West Virginia, um, but any state that borders up against the ocean and has a water body feeding into it probably does. Um, those estuaries can have habitats like mud flats, like you see here. Notice there's not a bunch of plants there, so that really helps us categorize what type of wetland it is. Um, there can also be deltas. Moving along, um, ponds are probably something you're pretty familiar with. You've maybe seen those before. Those are a type of wetland. There's also fins, which are groundwater fed. Um, so these are not fed from a river. Um, it's all from the groundwater. So they're at a really low point. You've probably heard of a swamp. Um, these areas are vegetated by trees and shrubs. You notice there's a lot of different plant life going on here. Um, a slough is a backwater of a water system. So uh, there might be a river and some of the backwater comes into here. So this water level can fluctuate quite a bit. Um, that's a type of wetland. Bogs, like we looked at before, they have no inlet or outlet. Um, so these are also groundwater fed. And over in Europe, there's things called mirrors, which are peatlands and they have a really slow process. Um, things are not changing quickly there. Um, but it's still providing critical habitat. And down in Texas, um, we have these really important things called playas, and these are just another term for a dry lake. So at certain seasons, these areas here, they fill up with water, and these are essential for migratory birds to stop and feed and rest in before flying on down south. And then we also have bottomlands, which are just floodplains along streams. So we have a lot of this type of wetland in our state too, or maybe I should say, we used to have a lot of this type. So that can hopefully give you a, a little bit of an idea of the different types of wetlands out there. There are there's so many, um, and I just hope you have a, a better idea of what they can look like and how big that spectrum is. So, okay, I've backed your head off about all the different types of them and how we characterize them. Why are they important? Let's look at this infograph here that shows wetland functions. And this shows some of them, but not all of them. Um, we could talk all day about how they provide functions for us. Uh, one of the main things that they do, especially in our state, is they dissipate stream energy. So if you've ever seen floodwaters or rainwaters, there's usually a lot of sediment that gets churned up in that. And water is very powerful. So when it comes rushing down, if there's an area for it to and to dissipate its energy at into a wetland, um, it will slow down. Wetlands have different types of plants in them that are used to being in these different levels of water. They slow that water down. They allow the sediment to fall out. And so the end result when the water leaves is that it's generally cleaner. 
it either re-enters the, the river um, through flowing into it or through the groundwater. Wetlands are like big giant sponges and that they can soak up and hold a lot of water. So they're also like a bathtub and that they can just store that water for periods of time until our stream is ready to receive more of it and it goes down into the groundwater. They also have these plants in it that not only slow down water, but they can also process the different types of contaminants or pollution um, that may enter into the waterway. And Martin will be telling you more about that. Um, and one thing that we're going to touch on later on today is that they provide critical habitat for wildlife. So we'll look at what that means here in a little bit too. A few other things is that uh, wetlands are also the kidneys of the landscape. Um, you might hear them getting called the kidneys of the earth. And you know how important kidneys are to our human body. So calling them the kidneys of the earth is a pretty big deal. Um, so you're gonna look a little bit more at that chemical exchange with Martin, but I just wanted to, when you think of kidneys, make sure that you're thinking of wetlands. <laughs> they also protect shorelines and banks from erosions, from erosion. Um, so you can see on, along this river here, there's no um, drop, there's no banks with eroded soil on them. We see that there's everything is vegetated along here. Um, some streams, there's not an area for that water to go out of its um, bank and release some of that energy and sediment and slow down. So you, if you can imagine if this stream was a higher level of water, it's going to hit this grass and it's going to help slow it down and dissipate some of that energy. It's also going to soak up some of that water and hold it. Um, so this is a really nice shoreline and bank for this river. This is something that we, we like to see. We want to see more of this in our state and you know, across the planet. Wetlands also store carbon and they moderate uh, global climate conditions. So especially if they are forested, they can actually hold a lot of carbon for us, um, which is really important in our day and age when we have a lot more of that being released into the atmosphere. Of course, they provide recreation. Um, you may have went bird watching in a wetland or you've went looking for frogs there or kayaking or fishing. They provide a lot of recreational activities. People like to just go and set in them and read and paint. They're very relaxing. Um, they make excellent outside classrooms because literally everywhere you look, there's something that you can teach your students about. Um, and in West Virginia, we have some different boardwalks that are being developed. And we're doing a better job of creating access into our wetlands without destroying their functions. And so you'll be learning a little bit more about that with Jack tomorrow. But they also provide cultural heritage and archeological evidence. Um, so if we look back at indigenous cultures, they got so many resources from these wetlands, food and shelter. Um, they were able to create baskets, um, boats, all different types of things. And some of, some of them even had wetlands as their burial grounds. Uh, so depending on where you were looking, um, this is actually a picture from, um, it's a depiction of what they found in Florida. So they were going dredging a wetland and draining it. And they found all these different bodies that were about 7,000 years old um, from an ancient culture. So it's pretty neat <clears throat> to look into. Um, there's a lot of cultural heritage with our wetlands and that's something I really enjoy learning more about too. They also provide fuel, timber and food, not only to indigenous cultures, but also to us currently today, you know, that's still happening. So if you have um, alligator meat, you know, those alligators have to live in a wetland setting. Um, if you eat rice that's raised in wetlands as well as cranberries, and a lot of our wood pellets are actually created from trees that are in wetlands. Wetlands also help stabilize water supplies and they reduce flooding, which is really important in our state. Um, and so we'll look a little bit more into that. So they can absorb, like I said before, they can absorb flood waters like a sponge. So they slow that energy down with the plants and then they also hold it um, until it's a proper time to release it back out into our water table. Um, they also, that the vegetation is going to be slowing down that water and the soils is going to help stabilize, um, or sorry, the roots are going to be stabilizing the soil. 
So the different plant life that we have in here, it helps stabilize that soil so it doesn't wash away and create more erosion. And it also provides, you know, a really important habitat um, for animals like this. And if we look down here, I, I think this is a really powerful picture. I hope you can see it pretty clearly. But I, I believe this is in Florida. And over here on the right hand side, um, there's more of a natural setting. I'm sure this has been changed some, but it's pretty natural looking. You can see there's some water in there. And then just across the road, we just have houses after houses. Um, and so you can see that a lot of flood protection was lost because we changed the system. Um, and now this area, it's not able to absorb and control flood waters um, like this is over here. So I think it's important to think about that. When you think of wetlands, think of them as biological super systems. When we think of rainforests, we think, wow, there's so many different species of animals that live there, so many plants, and we have yet to even you know, discover all the life that lives there. Um, coral reefs, which are also a type of wetland, are very similar in that they hold so much diversity of our oceans um, in these small little spaces. And wetlands are just like that. Um, they should be viewed in the exact same category as rainforests and coral reefs. So if we look at the, the biodiversity that we see in a wetland, um, we can really focus in on the food chain and how important it is. There's a lot of plant material that dies off every season and goes into the water and that feeds these different animals. Um, down here, different types of invertebrates and zooplankton. And then of course, that is a critical component to the next level of animals like our turtles, our tadpoles, our dragonflies, um, things like that. So all those animals then feed our fish and our raccoons. Um, are your slides not synced with your lecture? They should be, Judith, you should be able to see wetland biodiversity right now. Um, if you all can't see that, please let me know in the chat box. But for instance, um, look at how many different things feed into this heron here. You take a few of those away, pretty soon the heron's not gonna have enough to eat. I'm sure you know how the food web works but these wetlands just hold so much life in them. They're really a critical component to our food web. Okay, thank you, Christy, for confirming. So if we look a little bit more at the biodiversity, um, they are a critical food source, yes, but also shelter, not just for adults, but mainly for young. Um, they provide critical breeding ground to ensure that species survive too. So all three of these animals they really have to have wetlands in order to exist. Um, in West Virginia, we have over 150 rare and endangered plants that depend on wetlands just for survival. And I'm, I'm sure that um, Jack and also Martin will touch a little bit more on that. So if we look at, um, I'm just gonna pick two, one plant and one animal to dive a little bit more into. Um, but one plant that really depends on wetlands to survive is a cattail. And I think a lot of people, when they think of a wetland, they think of cattails. They're pretty common to see around, especially in West Virginia. Um, they're pretty neat plants. The unfortunate part is that uh, the ones that we have in West Virginia are non-native and they're kind of choking out some of our other plants that we want to see in our wetlands. But if we push that aside, they're really cool plants. Um, they have fed so many different people over the years. Um, you can still eat their tubers here, so their root. Um, they send off these rhizomes that stabilize the soil, and that's how they mainly spread. Um, but they can also spread through their seeds up here. Um, this can also be eaten and crushed into flour. So there's a lot of food um, just from a cattail that you can use. Um, but also you can make mats that you sleep on out of their leaves um, because they have these air sacs in them that are essentially like little bubbles, little insulation, make ground a little bit cushier for you. Um, they've also been used in cult many different cultures to make baskets and shelters out of. Uh, so they're pretty neat plants. Um, as the water rises up, because they have these air sacs in them, they remain buoyant. So they've even been used in the structure of boats. Another uh, one that we can look at here is our beaver. 
And I'm sure you know a little bit about beavers, but there's so much to learn about them. They're such amazing creatures and they have truly adapted to live in a wetland. Um, so they get their food source from there. They do have a preference for different types of trees. Um, their shelter, so their den that they build there, they have to go underwater and up into the shelter. And that is how they keep predators out of their den. And they also breed in the water or in the den. So they have to have these components in order to survive. And very obviously this animal is adapted to live in the water with its tail and its feet and their second eyelids. Um, they're just really neat animals. So let's turn our focus now to anurans. And this is just a fancy word that we like to use for a tailless amphibian. So basically if it's a frog or a toad, it is an anurin. And just so you know, all toads are frogs. So let's just call them frogs to make it a little bit simpler. These are pretty interesting animals. And um, just to, to show you a little bit of the differences between them, this animal uh, photoed here is a frog. Um, all of them are frogs, but this is one that we would find near water almost all the time. Um, they have webbed feet. They're specially adapted to swim in that water. They breathe through their skin. Um, they have a second eyelid, and even whenever they swallow, you might see them shut their eye because they have to use that force to swallow their food down. Uh, of course, they lay um, eggs in their water. Frogs and toads both do that, and they have to go through a metamorphosis to turn into a frog. At that point, toads will leave the pond, frogs will stay near the pond. They also have a vocal sac, um, which makes them pretty unique. They're one of the only amphibians that can vocalize, and the males are the only ones that do that. So just like birds chirp to each other during mating season and to alert each other, um, frogs also will do that. They've also been around on planet Earth for a really long time. So I think they're a pretty critical animal in our food chain at this point. Many animals depend on them for food, and they do an excellent job of breaking down plant material for us um, and for other animals in the food chain. So if we look at West Virginia, we're a pretty northern state um, in some regards. And considering how far north we are, we have 14 different species of frogs and toads, which is quite a bit um, for how north we are. And the size of these animals ranges quite a bit um, from one and a half inches to seven. And most of these, if we have them in one county, we have them in all of them. That's not true for all 14 species, but for most of them. So I'm going to show you just five different species, just to introduce you a little bit to the different frogs and toads that we have in our state. Uh, the first one, and perhaps my favorite, is the wood frog. Um, the wood frog is the only frog that you'll find in the state of Alaska. So I think that's pretty neat. They're actually the very first animal that will emerge, well, I should say the first frog that will emerge and lay eggs. Um, they are known to lay eggs when there's still ice in the pond. So you'll see them emerge in February, which is just around the corner. So if you're out walking around, make sure you listen for their sound and their call. Um, the way that you can tell that they're wood frog is not only from hearing them call, but also they have this black mask that goes across their eye here. And this animal spends its whole life um, close to the water. They will never venture too far away. So here's what their call sounds like. The size of a wood frog, uh, about, let's say, four inches. Um, if I had to just throw a number out there, they're a little bit smaller than my hand. Um, so if you're out this spring, listen for wood frogs. They are our first sign of spring. And you could see the little vocal sacs inflating on the side there of them. Okay, the next animal we're going to look at is a northern spring peeper. And the spring peeper, I think, is the animal that most people associate with spring. Um, but the wood frog actually beats them to it. Uh, they emerge out in about March. And they have this X on their back if you ever get the opportunity to actually see one. The spring peeper is about the size of a quarter. So these photos are taking are taken um, very close up of them. They're very little guys and they make a really powerful sound. 
So here's their sound. I'm sure you've heard it before. And again, you can see that X there on their back. There's also the mountain chorus frog, which is about the same size and is found in roadside ditches. Um, so you might hear them calling, but if you get the opportunity to see one, you see that X, you know it's a northern spring peeper. Um, the next one we're looking at is the Eastern American toad. Um, and I'm a big fan of toads. I just really like the way they hold themselves. Um, if you're driving along a road in the spring and you see an animal that's not moving out of the road, it's probably the Eastern American toad. They're like miniature bulldogs. Um, they are very warty, as you can see here. Um, and we have three different toad species in West Virginia. And I would, I'd love to show you all of them, but we won't have time today. This animal though, they only come to a wetland to lay their eggs and then they get out of there. Um, they are normally found in lawns or forested areas. We don't find them actually near ponds, um, except for in their breeding season. So in the spring, when we're getting those heavy rains, really keep an eye out on the roads because the, a lot of animals are crossing to get into these wetland areas. And here's what their call sounds like. I always like to challenge uh, students to hold their breath during that because <laughs> it's a pretty long call. Uh, but as you can see, he's just in here calling for a mate. Um, and then after they mate and they lay several thousand eggs in a string, they will both book it out of there back into the forest. Our big dog, the largest frog that we have is the American bullfrog. And the American bullfrog has a call that sounds like a mooing cow, which is incredibly fitting. Um, they will pretty much eat about anything they can fit in their mouth. So this animal, we might not think of frogs as being a predator, but this animal is a predator. <laughs> it just doesn't have big sharp teeth and claws, um, but they are very good hunters. They will eat mice, they will eat birds, um, different frogs, salamanders, pretty much whatever they can fit in their mouth. And so let's give a listen to their call here. So if you're ever at a pond area, if you sit and listen, you're probably here in American bullfrog. They're very common in our state. Um, and if you've ever eaten frog legs, it's probably been an American bullfrog leg. The last animal I'm gonna to talk to you about today is called the Northern Leopard Frog. And this animal is actually a species of concern in West Virginia. Um, we've lost a lot of excellent habitat um, in our wetland setting along the Ohio River. Um, and we think that that is maybe one of the reasons why we don't find this animal as frequently. Um, it does like to live though, kind of in the Western part of the state. Um, McClintic Wildlife Refuge is one place that we're still finding them. And of course, they're named the northern leopard frog because, hey, they look like a leopard. Now, the northern leopard frog has another animal in West Virginia that looks a lot like it called the pickerel frog. And it has spots on it just like this, but their calls are a little bit different. And the pickerel frog has a very bright golden color down here on its legs and on its belly. As you notice on the northern leopard frog, it does not. So let's give um, their call a little listen. It's very unique and maybe a little creepy. So they have a little bit of a snore followed by rapid grunts. And as you can guess, just from looking at this animal, um, they do have to have water around all year long. I'm um, just like our bullfrog. So if you'd like to learn more about the different toads and frogs that we have in West Virginia, um, actually my thesis advisor, Dr. Thomas Polly, partnered with West Virginia DNR and they made some booklets on that. And DNR actually has several booklets that you can check out and download. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about them, I would encourage that. You can just Google West Virginia DNR publications, click on the first link that comes up, 
scroll down to where it says booklets and we have all these different ones here um, made for the public to view. So, wow, right? Wetlands are so great. They must be everywhere. They must be protected. Um, well, that's what we're here to talk to you about. So where we have wetlands at um, is only about 6% of the Earth's surface. However, they count for 24% of the total global productivity, which is just crazy to me. And then just from mentioning the animals that I have today, you can see that they're, they're a critical component to animals breeding and then also rearing those animals up into adults. Um, so they account for 24% of total global productivity yet they're only 6% of the Earth's surface. This is a map showing you where most of our wetlands are at, um, so you can kind of get an idea. But we do find them in every country, in every climate zone, and from the polar regions to the tropics. So all over our beautiful planet, we do have wetlands, and we used to have a lot more. And if we look at Canada, Canada has 15% of the world's wetlands acreage which is saying a lot. Um, and they are also, this habitat is um, summer habitat for the last remaining flock of wild whooping cranes. And this is an animal that has seen a sharp decrease, um, not only because they were hunted, but also because their habitat has been removed. And so it's now estimated that there's um, just under 100, about an 85 left. Um, only about 14 of them were wild hatched and the rest are captive reared. So this is a species that is just on the brink of extinction. Um, and so I'm glad that we now have um, ways to protect our wetlands and hopefully we can get some of that habitat back for them. Um, so I like to kind of poke at things a little bit. So here's my meme for 2021. Oh, you just drained a wetland. Tell me more about how you're improving the land. Um, because as we've learned, wetlands are very important to the land just being you know, what they are. Wetlands have been dredged. They've been filled, drained, polluted, and degraded over the years. And Jack's going to tell you a little bit more about the history on that tomorrow. But less than half of the, nation, the nation's wetlands remain. And they're now protected by the Federal Clean Water Act. So you'll learn more about that tomorrow with Jack. So just as a reminder, tomorrow you get to meet Jack and learn more about the history of regulations and our beautiful wetlands that we have right here in West Virginia. And then session three will be led by Martin Chris, who's going to really dive into how they exchange different chemical properties um, and also educational resources that we have available to you. Um, so these are just some of my favorite photos of different critters that I've found in West Virginia wetlands over the years. Um, and if you have any questions at this point, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question, um, or you can type them in the chat box. And this is my contact information. If you need me, um, if you think of a question down the road, feel free to reach out to me then. I put everybody to sleep. <laughs> Very interesting. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Great. All right. I'm going to go ahead. Diagram again. Were you? Um, which one, Christy? I think it was one. It was the big detailed one that you used to. Um, where you brought over the different wetland types and, and looked at your diagram to. Yeah, um, just give me a second to click way back up here. Yeah, it was way back there. And um, You're talking about the flow chart, right? Yes, and, and you know, on my laptop, I don't really see that very well. So is, is that something you could share with us? Um, yeah, yeah, I can um, email that to you. I can, I can snip it if that's okay. Yeah, Christy, if you could, if you don't mind, drop your email in the chat box and I'll send it over to you. I would actually, did you get, uh, Tommy, did you see how to, uh, you have the ability to email everyone in the class? So I would say, 
if you're okay to do that through Lumens, or you can send it to me and I'll send it because I bet everyone in the class would really like that. Okay. Yeah, I can just drop my whole presentation in there too. Sure. As long as you're good with that, they'll appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Michelle. Tommy, I've seen that little teeny tiny toads about the size of your thumbnail. Yeah. Now, are those evolving toads or do they, or is that yeah. something that's tiny? Yeah, they are probably um, last year's toadlets. <laughs> so um, toads will metamorph from a tadpole into a little tiny toad. Um, and I think it's about 60, 90 days. Usually by the end of August, they've metamorphed out of their pools. And yeah, it's usually when they're drying up too, so that's good. Um, and then it can take them about two to three years to actually grow into a full-size toad that we're aware of, which you know is about this big, about three inches, a little bit smaller than a wood frog. So probably what you have is last year's um, babies. So do they hibernate? They do, they kind of like burrow down into the soil um, and they're in substrate, maybe in leaf, you know, different leaves or um, whatever they can get into. But they do that in the forested areas. And actually the spade foot toad, um, they actually have, they're really cool. It's another toad we have in West Virginia. They have little spades on their hind feet and they burrow into like sandy areas and will completely cover up except for their eyes. But a lot of these animals will burrow down into the ground and kind of hang out there throughout the winter season and then reemerge. Hi, Tommy. Can you um, can you play the different frog frog sound five different frog sounds again? Um, yeah. Is there a certain one that you wanted to hear? No, no. I want to hear all of them. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, we actually have a presentation um, where I go through all 14 species um, that I can send to you too. It's on our DEP YouTube channel. Because oh. I do that presentation at camps with students. They, they love it. And I love showing them, you know, the different frog calls. Let me flip through here though, and we can get to them um, here. There we go. Yep, so here's the wood frog again. And when they are all calling together, that's just one calling. When they're all calling uh, calling together, they really do sound like a flock of ducks just quacking. Um, it's really neat. And then spring peepers are kind of deafening if you're around a whole lot of them at once. I think the other one, yeah, the Eastern American toad has that really long trill. Some of them aren't quite that long of a trill, <laughs> but he's, he's got a good vocal sack on him there. This is the American bullfrog. And the last one was the Northern leopard frog. I think that's all I had on, on this presentation, but I can um, put a link in there to share with you all uh, of all of the species that we have in their calls. It would be interesting to see how physically they do that. I mean, how do they blow up like that? And do they have some sort of diaphragm that, that vibrates? Um, yeah, I think it has to do with the shape of their vocal sac and how the air moves over it. Um, and you might have noticed like some of them have really quick calls and then some of them it's a very long process. Um, I'm not sure, I couldn't tell you how all the mechanics of them work, um, but their calls are all very, very different, just like we see with birds. And you're actually able to assess what their population size is 
just by listening to them call, um, which is a pretty neat thing to do too. Any sense of how long some of these frogs live? Are we talking about a year or more? Oh yeah, they, they live, um, you know, depending on what predators are in the area and if their home's getting filled or drained, um, it, it can vary quite a bit, but they can last up to, you know, 20, 25 years. I think the oldest toad has lived maybe 22 or 23 years old in captivity. Um, but I think more likely is probably five to 10 years, depending on, you know, where they're at and what predators are around. And I, one thing I forgot to mention um, that I meant to is if we look back at the American bullfrog, um, this animal and also the green frog, both of them, their tadpoles have to stay in water for multiple years. So unlike the toad, you know, it hatches out, it's a little tadpole, and then it's out of there in about 60 to 90 days. The bullfrog and the green frog, their tadpole they're much bigger and they stay in that water as a tadpole for two to three years, um, maybe even longer before they metamorph into a frog. So they have to be around water where there is, you know, where they have to be in a habitat where there is actually water present year round. They can't be in these little ones that dry up throughout the year. So I know you said that our our wetlands are protected by the Clean Water Act, but are, are there any in West Virginia, you know, that that aren't in protected areas like Cranesville Swamp or Cranberry Glades or, you know, Canaan Valley, something like that? Are there any that are in private hands where they might be more in danger? Um, there could be, and I think that's probably a better question for Jack to answer. Um, but essentially, you know, if, if they're considered waters of the state, then they are protected by the Clean Water Act. Now, if somebody has a farm pond on their property and they want to drain it, I don't think that there's any federal protection for that. But if it's been defined as a wetland um, by our group, you know, by our different agencies, then it does have protection. Over in the Suncrest Lake area, um, years ago, developers filled in a swampy area and they got fined for it, but they, they never really recreated it. And, you know, so they, they changed the flow of the water and, and that sort of thing, but they never, in fact, it's being built on right now. So um, are, are you familiar with those regulations or is that something I should leave for a later talk? Yeah, I can tell you a little bit about it now. Um, essentially, it's not that people can't go in and fill wetlands anymore. It's just that they have to pay a lot to be able to do that. And so they have to pay a fee that goes into mitigation of a wetland somewhere else or maybe of a waterway somewhere else. And they do like to keep it within that same like county or watershed area. Um, but it's, I would say that the money that was collected for them building on top of that wetland went to helping a wetland somewhere else or a waterway somewhere else in the local area. So it might have been restoring a riparian area along a stream or enhancing a wetland somewhere else. Um, but it, essentially that money goes into like a mitigation bank and then it gets reallocated out to different projects. So does that answer your question, Christy? Yes, and then Jack said that he's going to cover it hard tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to miss that class tomorrow, so I'll uh, look forward to the recording of that. that okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, Jack, Jack's got a lot of good information on that um, that I'm looking forward to learning more about, too. <laughs> Hopefully it'll get a little better going forward now, so. Yeah. Stop sharing a screen there. Um, any last questions? We have about a minute left, it looks like. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, and I did get one note that somebody would like to take the whole workshop. Um, we do offer um, WOW, the Wonder of Wetlands workshop, um, informal and informal educators 
can sign up for those workshops. We offer them free, free through DEP because um, DEP sponsors that program. So you can always um, send me an email, let me know if you're interested in attending. We usually do them in person at a wetland. Of course, right now um, we are all virtual due to the pandemic. So, um, but you can keep us in mind for down the road if, some, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and thank you all for spending this beautiful afternoon um, in front of a computer with me. I hope everybody gets to go outside and, and your day's sunny and bright. Uh, Michelle, do you have any final remarks? Nope, I just wanted to thank you again. And we'll see you tomorrow as well as Jack or just Jack? Um, I think just Jack. I'm going to try to pop in if I can as an audience member. OK, well, thank you again. We really appreciate that. This was wonderful. Sure, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. You have a great program going. Thank, thank you so you. much. I've thank learned you. a lot. Oh, great. Thank you, Laura. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. It's been great. Take care, y'all. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Michelle. Bye. Bye.